Welcome to In Real Time, where we as Heights Church are inviting you in for real conversations about leading people, organizations, and change in the new normal. We're hoping that our real discussions about our church's journey will help you as you reimagine and rebuild yours. Welcome to In Real Time, where we're having real conversations about leading people, organization, and change. And well, today we're doing our first book review or book interview, I should say. And uh, well, that book is called Supply Lines by Pastor Scott Nelson, and he's with me today. And this is about five supporting relationships that every pastor needs. So I want to speak specifically to our pastors, whether you're senior leads, associate pastors, any pastoral role, and I would just say leadership role within a church. What we're going to be talking about today is content you're going to want to be listening into. And well, the person who wrote this for us is a friend of mine. So Scott Nelson, him and I do uh, church plant coaching together together. And so uh, I've been hearing about this book for quite a while it's now, true. and it's, it's finally come out, and we get to talk about it today. I have read the book. I'm actually in the book. You're in the book. Which I thought was really my, nice. Oh, you thank are you. one of my supply lines, I and I uh, appreciate everything yeah. you've invested in my life. It's helped me yeah. a lot. And well, we've been able to help each other. We want to get good. more support into pastors' lives. Yeah. Um, pastors are supporting so many people mm -hmm. and, uh, we want them to get support too. Yeah, we really do. Really do. Well, yeah. uh, tell me a quick word about your family. Cause obviously you are not alone. You don't stand <laughs> alone. So what's your, what's your family uh, like? Yeah. I've been married, uh, 24 years, I have five children. There's a whole separate book about how to grow a church. Um, <laughs> wow. and, and how uh, to have five kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you could, right, but that's, right. that's been an act of just God. A lot of prayer, a lot of uh, growing my faith. Mm -hmm. but that's been wonderful. Love our family. Um, uh, Twenty-one down to twelve, wow. and uh, life is good. That's Ministry fun. is good. Yeah, nice, nice. And of course, your lovely life, lovely wife Hannah is a wonderful. I know She's we all incredible. just had dinner recently, and yeah, that was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. so fun. good stuff. Yeah. Well, I know that you are here uh, because you wrote this book, but I think it'd be really important for us to understand what your background really is that would talk about these, uh, relationships, these five supporting relationships in a pastor's life. Something tells me that this isn't just an idea you had. It might be a need that you've actually found in your own life yeah. and you have a solution for how we can yeah. meet that need. So talk to us a little bit about your, your background. Yeah. I mean, uh, doing, done ministry for 30 years now. Um, and really have seen the difference that support has made in my own life, but mm -hmm. was a little bit surprised how it came up. We'll, we'll get to that later. But I was a youth pastor for many years, moved m multiple times, different places in the country. Um, and then, planted a church about 14 years ago. Mm. And that's a very different experience. <laughs> that's very different. Uh, it's a lot of things in youth ministry prepared me for that. Yeah, for sure. A uh, little chaos, a lot of trusting in the Lord, um, having no budget. You know, th mm -hmm. those things were, were helpful. <laughs> that sounds about right. That's about yeah. right. Um, and then uh, five or six years ago, I was going through my doctorate, writing my dissertation. This came up been coaching church planners since then. Mm -hmm. um, so I've coached four church planners, kind of helped with training and assessment, yeah. um, even working with pastors and staff of just how do you help develop leaders um, and and how to support work in that as well. So I've been able to do yeah. seminars at different spots in the country, which has been a real honor yeah. on this material and also just on leadership development in general. Yeah, yeah. And so I think specifically we're we're really when we when we look into the reason for the why of the book. Yeah. Um, being in pastoral ministry has some actual pretty unique challenges. In isolation, I know is one of them. It mm -hmm. sounds so bizarre because mm -hmm. we're surrounded by people, uh, but it it does tend to be yeah. 
a huge, huge issue for pastors in, in really finding ourselves isolated. So could you speak to us a little bit about the why? Because this is, I think, what this book is helping us to overcome. Yeah. Ministry has always been hard. It's always going to be hard. Mm-hmm. But in the last decade or so, ministry has become increasingly lonely. Mm-hmm. Um Jesus had 12 close friends in his 30s. Most people would consider that a miracle mm. these days. That's it just, true. We, oh, we just good. were not set up to have real intimacy, and Jesus had that, mm-hmm. and Paul had that. Mm-hmm. You know, when Paul was in prison, people would just sit in prison with him. Yeah. Most Which of our, is a very crazy thought. When, it I is. mean, like, what? People came and did that? Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. people on the shipwreck with him, mm-hmm. Luke and Aristarchus, mm-hmm. they were under arrest. Mm-hmm. They weren't on the shipwreck with him Wow. just because Christians aren't alone. That yeah. was kind of the two by two Jesus sending you. Ministry is very, very lonely these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is really hurting our ministries. It's hurting yeah. our effectiveness. We're trying to pour from empty cups. Yeah. It doesn't really work. Um, and especially coming into this new normal, yeah. it's really starting to nail our, our spiritual leaders. Yeah. Can you talk to me about why is it getting more lonely? I mean, it is difficult in the sense that obviously ministry is we're leading in this day and age yeah. and just the culture of the church and the change that Jesus brings into a person's life. I realize... You know, being able to present that to culture, to our world, obviously one person at a time, you know, it's not an instant, heinous result, right? Um, And managing churches, there's a lot with organization and budgets, and there's all kinds of things that people just don't think about with pastors. Yeah. But this idea of loneliness, why is that happening to pastors? Well, I mean, the Surgeon General just released a report that... Mm. Almost half of our entire nation would be suffering from what would be called actual loneliness, and it has a whole bunch of problematic health effects. So if our country is lonely, Mm. that might also reflect our clergy. But I also think that our clergy deal with some extra challenges with loneliness because it's hard to be a person when most people in your life view you as a position. And... Mm. That even goes with our clergy. Wow, they don't good. always even see themselves as people. They go, I'm a I'm a person I'm a position first. Yeah. And so to have places you can be, to have appropriate vulnerability, appropriate, you know, like I can really share what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's really hard for us to find. And if anyone's been in ministry for any length of time, mm. they've been burned. Yeah. And they've had someone leave or say, Oh, you can be real with me, and then you realize I can't. Yeah. And there's an extra challenge with clergy to find spaces that they can actually experience true, just being a person first, true collegiality, true friendship. Um, But that, I think, leads to a problem. If we're in a lonely culture Mm. and our clergy, who I think one of our jobs is not just to connect people to God, but connect people to each other. Yeah. If we are disconnected... It's going to be very hard for us to connect others. Yeah. So my hope is if we can get clergy connected, our spiritual leaders connected, yeah. we're going to be able to lead the way and go, hey, just like Jesus, I got a group of people around me. Yeah. And you can too. Yeah. And here's our church is doing this, but you can do this in your own life. My hope is that that can really yeah. lead to some flourishing. Yeah. Oh, I think that's really great. It's, it's a great way to describe it. And I, and I think that the... I think the issue with the vulnerability, that, that's, that's a big part of it, because I know a lot of people within churches have had an expectation, especially historically, and I, I think that wall is coming down now, some at mm-hmm. least, uh, in a lot of ways, I think it, it is, but people have had an expectation of perfection to a pastor and to clergy in any role, mm-hmm. and which is completely unrealistic. But yet, at the same time, I understand people don't want to be led by hypocrites. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this yeah. dynamic yeah. that we find ourselves in, that we, we're not trying to hide our true selves, but at the same time, 
Some people just flat out don't want to know anything mm-hmm. um, about you that might not be perfect. And and, yeah. and 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 we aren't close friends with all people, just like anybody else. I'm yeah. not going to share my vulnerabilities with just anyone, but there are people I will and need to, yeah. just like any person will have a few close friends that they can do that with. Yeah. And such as, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling with fear and anxiety right now. Would you pray with me? You know, oddly enough, for a lot of pastors, that puts them in a very difficult place with someone in their church. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say I don't really experience that in my church, but I have experienced that in other churches that I've been at and been on staff at, and that was even a vulnerability you couldn't admit to. And so I think if someone's listening and wondering, well, why would it be a lonely place? Well, that one set up right there yeah. is enough yeah. to make you question whether or not you should even ask for that word of prayer right. from somebody in your church. And if you're not, if you don't have anybody in your church, well, then who will you go to? Yeah. And so I completely agree with you that this is a big challenge, and we know it is because when pastors are surveyed, we say it. Yeah. We're lonely. We're having a difficult challenge. Yeah, it's 70% of pastors say they don't have a single person they call a close friend. Wow. So it's this wow. connection to yeah. so many people. Yeah. But we all know there's this inner connection, maybe one or two inner connections. Yeah. There's a there's a line you cross where you say, mm-hmm. "Do you really know me as me?" As me. Yeah. And not the position. That's the loneliness said, that clergy feel is yeah. I don't know if anyone knows me as me. And I think there's many challenges mm-hmm. to this, but coming out of the last few years that we came through, yeah, I think the message clergy got was you're not allowed to have an opinion. Hmm. And if you're not allowed to have an opinion, it's pretty hard to feel like a person. Mm, yeah. And so the, I think what many clergy did is they said, I just won't have an opinion. I'll just preach the Bible. Yeah. I'll be a generic pastor, mm, but I'm not yeah. a person inside of that. Yeah. And that leads to loneliness yeah. because you're going, I can't have an opinion on Yeah. Things. And so when you say an opinion, you're like, you can't have an opinion on a mask or no mask, because if you do, I'm going to hate you. Uh, well, <laughs> you don't literally imagine people that you love and that you've mm. poured into mm-hmm. and you've walked with them through life saying, I don't agree with your opinion on this mask. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving the church. I'm not coming back. You can't be my pastor anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay to have different opinions on mask. It's yeah. okay to, it is. You know, but, yeah. but suddenly what a, the, the clergy kind of goes, I'm not going to share that. Right. That pain was real. That pain was real. And, and in other generations, yeah. there were other challenges to that. You know, you talked True. about, when mental health was something you couldn't talk about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so well, what, what do you do if you're depressed as, mm-hmm. as a clergy, as a pastor? You, yeah. What do I, how do I deal with that? Every generation is going to have challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, but my concern is in coming into this new normal is that we can help clergy process. What our world is processing is we've sort of become more isolated and lonely. Yeah. Um, and we gotta, if we're going to move into this new normal, we, we have to find a way to re-engage support. Well, I love the fact that you're naming it, and I think in the book you actually talk about it as hitting the wall or coming to that crisis point. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think um, you know, I mean, I've read the book cover to cover and completely agree with it, and really found myself in here at different times in my ministry where I was lacking the supply lines in my life, and I was suffering for it for sure. And but I'd never really thought about all five of these supply lines as you're talking about it, which really are relationships that you have in your life. Yeah. And, you know, I know immediately as we're talking about supply lines, it sounds so, you know, corporate. It's like, no, it's actually (laughs) way more personal than that. Yeah. And we do have these people in our life already, oftentimes, and sometimes you need to go be a little more intentional about it. But uh, as we've talked about the actual problem, uh, you actually have a solution, which I think is very smart and doable for any one of us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, whether you feel like you're in a healthy place or whether you feel like you're not in a healthy place, 
you're recommending supply lines in your life no matter what, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. 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 So talk about that. Unpack this a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, the simple plan, and it really is a simple plan. It's not hard to figure out. It's just hard to do. Uh, but the simple plan is to write, literally write down these five things. Mm -hmm. And I believe the categories are more helpful than the, than the name. So if you say, well, I have a mentor. Well, is the mentor more this category or this supply line? It, it's helpful to actually have the categories. That's why I, I, I list yeah. them out. But to write them down and then to say, I'm going to find some people to meet with about monthly yeah. in this. You can have it be groups, but one-on-one -on -one tends to be better because then more attention is put on you. Mm -hmm. And I know if we're talking to pastors, they're <laughs> going to say, I don't want all the attention on me because that feels selfish. And I would just say to them, do you think it's selfish when someone's coming to you mm -hmm. or when you're discipling someone? They would say, absolutely not. And then I go... So do you think everyone needs a pastor? And they would go, absolutely. And then I go, do you think you need a pastor? And they go, I don't like that. I don't yeah. like that question. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all we all need spiritual leaders. We, we all do. need mentors. We all and again, you can use whatever titles you want. Mm -hmm. We can write down these five things and say who mm -hmm. and when. Mm -hmm. And I say you should try to find at least three people you can meet with one on one. Monthly. That's yeah. my simple. You can modify that. That's my simple version. Yeah. And most pastors, senior pastors, associate pastors have twenty to forty meetings a month, mm -hmm. and they're usually primarily for the other person. Yeah. I'm advocating for you to have yeah. three that are primarily for you. Yeah. And if you can't find your friends, then I would say go get professionals. Get a spiritual yeah. director. Get a therapist. Get yeah, it's it's pretty obvious when you walk into, you know, a therapist, you know, you don't say, well, how are you? And they go, oh, great. Let me. Yeah, they don't do that. Can you pastor me? Yeah. You don't know, because you're paying to be there. Yeah. You know, when you first told me that stat uh, about, you know, meetings, I never even considered it. Yeah, they are. They're, they're all about this other person, which it should be. That's what we do. Yeah. But at the same time, the question comes, well, when will it be about you? Yep. Because you do need. Yep. Your tank's filled too, and it's not. It's not that pastors are trying not to. It's just that we, our our list is never done. And again, I'm not trying to say that we're yeah. different from everybody yeah. else because, quite honestly, Scott, as I read through the book, you know, these supply lines are good for everybody. I mean, you could be a CEO. Yeah. Yeah. You can be somebody yeah. working on a production line. You need these people in your life, and so yep. it's not just for pastors. So. Um, Really, all of us need it, but we do have to be intentional because there aren't people beating down our door very often to say, hey, I just want to speak into your life. Yeah. Now, and I have are, had people... If they are, but sometimes I, I don't want yeah, to. No, right. You're like, wait a <laughs> yeah, minute, hold yeah, on a second. That's, yeah. yeah, it's a different hey, kind of really speaking into Jesus my life. Jesus from me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but no, who are those people that have permission mm -hmm. and that I'm going to give permission yeah. in order to help? So, all right, so I'm going to name these out and I'm going to have you just kind of tell me a little Perfect. bit about them. So we've got soul sharpeners, uh, vision casters, tail kickers, friends and heart healers, yeah. uh, strategic thinkers. So these are the different categories that you look at and you yep. say, man, these are people that you really do need in your life. And so talk to me about these. Let's talk about the soul sharpeners. They spur us closer to yeah. Christ. Yeah. Why do I need this in my life? One of the things that can help is to almost bring any scenario. It, why you need all five of these things. Imagine bringing any scenario uh, you know, something went wrong, something great happened. You're trying to plan an event and you bring that to one of these people and people mm -hmm. are wired kind of more for one or two of these than others. Yeah. And so you bring it to a soul sharpener, something went bad in your weekend service and they're going to go, I'm really sorry, Craig, that's a bummer. What do you think God's telling you? What's happening in your soul right now? <laughs> right. What's going on? Let's yeah. process this. Let's pray about it. Yeah. They're not going to try to fix it. Yeah. They're going to point you to God. Mm -hmm. um, you bring it to a vision caster and they go, man, that's, that's a bummer. But what could God do with this? What could be next? Mm. How big? What else? The mm. vision casters are the dreamers. Like yeah. you bring them a problem, they go, the problem's an opportunity. Yeah. Right? Let's, what could this become? Uh, the, the motivators, they're, they're, they're kind of like, you know, that's tough. 
you got this. Mm -hmm. Stop whining. Let's go. <laughs> you know, whining. like, yeah, this is just today. Let, let's move on. Yeah. You know, like, or, or they're kind of cheering, like you, you can do it. Like mm -hmm. God's, they believe in you. They push you. The friends, the heart healers, they can either go like, oh my gosh, that's how are you? Mm, yeah. How are you? How are you responding to that? Are you going to be okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes your friends are also like, get over it. Let's go shoot hoops. Yeah. Let's, let's go throw the Frisbee. Let's, let's go get coffee. Yeah. The strategic people, they're the ones, of course, we're going to go, okay, your weekend service wasn't good. Let's talk about why. Here's three things you're going to do. Here's someone you're going to call. Here's a resource you have. Here's a book you're going to read. Here's a podcast you're going to listen to. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the more practical. Now imagine one meeting trying to cover all of those things. Yeah. It's not going to happen. No, no. It's and not everybody's wired to do all of Exactly. Those. But imagine right. if you're missing any of those things. Imagine yeah. if for a whole year you never had anyone go, how's your soul? Mm, yeah. How's God speaking to you through that problem? Yeah. But imagine coming in with a problem or questions, good to be intentional. Yeah. And you actually said, I know I can ask this person about this. Yeah. And they're going to ask me not how to fix it. Yeah. They're going to ask me about my soul and then they're going to challenge me to get it done. Or yeah. they're going to be a vision person and they're going to do some strategy. You can kind of have a mix or you can find five people. Um, but it's really going to elevate. If you're not in crisis and, and there's a lot, there's some stuff in the book about crisis. Yeah. But if you're not, it's going to elevate your ministry because you're going to be talking to people. You're going to be bringing them your ideas, your problems, and they're going to help you think higher thoughts yeah. about those deeper thoughts about those. Mm -hmm. um, I think about that, especially with vision casters. You don't want, you go to a conference, you read a book, you hear a podcast, and suddenly you come to your staff and you're like, we're changing everything. And they're yeah. freaking out. Way better to talk to a vision. I used to work for that guy. <laughs> we <laughs> that all is have. exactly what happened we every four to six months. <laughs> Everything's changing. Yeah. You yeah. go to a conference and everyone's praying, please, Lord, no. no. Yeah. yeah, don't go. <laughs> but imagine coming back and you go, I'm going to bounce that off of a vision caster and they're going to go, this is so great. What are you going to stop doing so you can start doing this? You go, mm -hmm. oh, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. They're going to say, uh, how does this fit into what you're currently doing now? Mm -hmm. What will be the impact of this on your staff? Now you're not using your staff or your board or your council as a, as your sounding board, you're using it as a second step mm, and you're going, yeah. I'm pretty sure this is pretty solid. I've bounced it off of a couple of really wise people who've mm. been there. Yeah. They're visionaries, but now we need to work on it. So there's still collaboration. Yeah, there still is. Yeah. But I, I'm bringing an idea that's not totally raw in yeah, that's and good. your ministry is just going to get elevated. Mm -hmm. And in our current world, we need ministry to elevate, but People are saying, pastors are saying, church planters are saying, I got nothing in the tank. Yeah, yeah. And so what I'm saying is, well, then let's fill that tank. Yeah, no, that's good. And I, I think that uh, I know in the book you talk specifically about the years of a church planter. I think it's years four through seven, Yeah. where typically you kick the church off, you've got a lot of support, but somewhere yeah. around year four... A lot of that support diminishes, and then you find yourself in a lonely place for about these, th these next three years. And and honestly, that's kind of the space where people uh, are broken, yeah, right? Because they're doing it all by themselves, or or they're they're doing it more alone than they did the first three four years, and that's yeah. really hard. Yeah. And so you saw that gap and said, "Hey, I've got to step into this," because you saw this in your ministry coaching experiences. Yeah. Yeah, and went through it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think as far as that church planting piece as well, I want to make sure that doesn't get missed here because I think there's a lot of information I know you told me, um, and of course myself doing this with you, the church planting coaching. There's a lot of materials on those first three years. We get them up flying, but but once they're up in the air, there's that longer period of time that people really aren't talking about four through seven. Yeah, and really, it's even past seven. Yeah, it's, it's about to on, ten. Right? How long does it take before it a church is considered established? Yeah, where it could actually care for its clergy mm -hmm. in a way that you don't need some sort of extra external support. And yeah. I think you always need supply lines, Yeah. but even, you know, there's a whole list of metrics on that. And 
I am working on a project right now with our denomination of how do you think about this differently? It's almost, many of us have a background in youth ministry. It's almost like youth ministry in its infancy Yeah. of they're not kids, they're not adults. And with a lot of our church plants in year four, it's like a young church and you're kind of going, you've gotten everything you need. Mm-hmm. It, it'd be like putting a 12 year old, a group of 12 year olds in a house going, good luck. That sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> if I was <laughs> a 12 year old. If you were a 12 year old, but yeah. for our church planners, it's leading to a lot of uh, struggle and isolation. And I yeah. don't think it has to cost a lot of money, but we need to train them mm-hmm. that support. And this is for everybody, not just church planners. Yeah. It's the same story I've heard from many pastors of Early in my life, I had a lot of people in my life. I had a lot of support, a lot of friends, yeah. a lot of people cheering me on, a lot of mentors. And then four or five years into ministry, I started feeling pretty lonely. Yeah. That you don't realize that support tends to diminish over time and you mm-hmm. have to go back. You have to cultivate it. Mm-hmm. You have to rebuild it. You have to get new connections. Yeah. yeah. And what older people, people my age used to call it networking, mm-hmm. but you can't just network. You got to take a network connection and then go, can we do coffee? Mm -hmm. I got some questions about this Yeah, and see how that goes. And if it goes well, then you go, this was really helpful. Could could we do it again? Right. And now you're starting to build an actual network of support around you. Yeah, that's good. Now, um, when you come to these people in your life, you're you're really looking for people who are already doing this in a sense, right? And you Mm -hmm. recognize they have this gift of strategic thinking or visionaries. So you're trying to identify people that are already present in your life and then just kind of make it more official. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it really depends on what it is. You want people to be really good at what they're doing. They may not be older than you. I mean... Yeah, they older don't have older to be. people, older clergy struggle a lot with some of this because they're going. There's no really no one who has more experience than I do. Yeah, it's more about getting a visionary person, even if they're younger. Yeah, I, I think that's what kind of tripped up Moses. Mm. His big mistake he made because all of his support had died. Yeah, his his mm. sister died in the same chapter where he struck the rock and God yeah. told him to speak to the rock. I mean. She was one of his supply lines. Yeah. So also, let's say you're this dynamic, visionary person. You can find another visionary person, but you don't need to find a dynamic, visionary soul sharpener. You just need someone who's really good about the soul. Yeah. You know, and I've heard pastors go, well, I could never listen to that person's input because their church isn't as big as mine. Mm. As opposed oh, to going, no, 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 terrible. They're they're further down this road, and they're yeah. further down this road. And um, of course, since the strategy one and the vision, you, you ideally you would want to have people who share your chair and yeah. can speak into that, and maybe are a little further down the road than you. Yeah, sometimes that helps. Um, but again, I I don't I don't if I'm meeting with my therapist, I don't want someone who's this pro pastor. I want someone who's like. I know about emotional health Mm -hmm. way better than you. Yeah. And I know how to ask you the right questions. Yeah. And that's going to grow me a lot. That's good. It's good. Well, I love in the book, you really unpack that for each one of these and help us find those people in our life or start searching for them. Yep. So uh, really, 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 really good. I I think about... um, you know, the success that we want to have in our life. And when I say success, I mean, I actually want to achieve what God's called me to do. That's what I would look at as success. And I know that I can't do that alone. I have to have people in my life. And Mm -hmm. I know also that I can't supply everything for all the tanks in my life. I have got to let other people pour into me, Yeah, which is why I know our church is built around community. Why? Because people need people. But as you said, pastors often feel lonely. We don't know who to reach out to, who's safe. And so, yeah, it's it's a real issue. I love that you've been able to address this as a, as a whole and actually create a, a simple, I think, plan yep. that honestly, you probably have most of the tools, if not all of them, already in your life to start. Yeah. And... Um, and then and just get going. Yeah, but you got to go and ask tanks. people, and you got to get it on gotta the calendar. Got to be intentional about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. 
So, hey, Scott, as we're wrapping up uh, the book here, I want to make sure, is there anything we didn't talk about already that you think, hey, we just got to make sure we, we hit on this particular topic before we're wrapping up today? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing I would say is for many people in the last few years, what they feel like is they went through a crisis. Yeah. And there's a whole chapter in the book about how God actually works through crisis to get us through the wall, to grow us, to change us. And, but I think for a lot of us as clergy, we're, we try to went, go through that crisis on our own mm -hmm. um, or not really getting the support we needed. And um, God can grow us and change us and, and just develop us yeah. through that. Um, and there's been a lot in church history about getting through the dark night of the soul. Yeah. And how we're actually different, more mature people on the other side. We view God and ministry mm -hmm. less transactionally. Mm -hmm. Like, God, if you do this for me, if you grow my church, if this happens, um, we view ourselves with much more acceptance. Like, I'm not going to be the perfect pastor. Yeah. I'm going to be a child of God. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's good. And, and I'm not going to be liked by everybody. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing because when you give up not needing to be liked by everybody, people tend to like you more because you're not trying to. Yeah, you're not trying to be so desperate to earn it. You're just True. kind of you're you're in a healthy detachment, not mm. not in an unhealthy detachment, but a healthy mm. like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, but you have to kind of go through what often is called the wall or the dark night and. You want to guide through that. Yeah. And um, I think if we can do that well, yeah. then we can guide others well. Yeah. And I think with each of these supply lines, there's a way of actually setting it up for other people. Yeah. That means it's not all on you because often as senior leads, but even as youth pastors and associate pastors, we try to do all five of these for everybody else. Yeah. Rather than saying, hey, these are the ones I'm really good at you're going to need to go find these for for yourself. And then as a senior lead, you can go, yeah, this is what our staff meetings tend to be like. But if you're going to get this, you're probably going to need to go get it over here. And, and I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Yeah. And that can be really helpful. Right. Yeah. I really want to yeah. encourage you with that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a really good point. And I think one thought that just came to my mind as we're wrapping up would just be that, you know, there's times when my emotions can be so raw that, I know I don't see it clearly and I need to be able to talk with someone. Yeah. And at that moment, yeah. it's not the wrong time necessarily, but it's not the best time to find that person. It's, it would be great to already have that person on speed dial. <laughs> be able to say, Hey, I got this raw emotion and I need you to help me process it. Whatever that would be. That's right. Whether it's about a hurt, a present issue, or a future challenge that you right. really want to tackle. Yeah. So now yeah, it's really, really good. Thank you for joining me on this. Thank you. And again, the book is Supply Lines, and really want to encourage all of you to pick it up. It is at Amazon, I know. And uh, um, if you would like uh, any more information on that, you can also reach out to Scott Nelson at Covenant Grove. That's right. Church in uh, Modesto, California. So That's right. We, uh, we're so glad that you joined us today in real time as we're having real conversations about leading people, organization, and change. And we'll see you next time. And don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell notification so you don't miss one episode as it drops.